The Lord be with you. And And with with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus. Go away, they said. Leave this place because Herod means to kill you. And he replied, you may go and tell that fox this message. Learn that today and tomorrow I cast out devils. And on the third day, attain my end. But for today and tomorrow and the next day, I must go out, since it would, be, it would not be right for a prophet to die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her brew under her wings, and you refuse? So be it. Your house will be left to you. Yes, I promise you, you shall not see me till the time comes when you say, Blessed on him who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today we have the last piece of the section on on Ephesians. And, And in it, what we hear is, something of a teaching that is so important for our time. And it kind of pulls together Ephesians. Remember Paul starts by blessing God for all the graces we received in the heavenly places before ever the time and world began. He chose us in Christ. And he starts in this big cosmic reflection on the way that we have been chosen before time in God's heart and, and been given grace upon grace in superabundance. He goes into the mystery, and the great mystery is that God has reconciled the world to himself. The Jew and Gentile both have same access to the same grace that comes through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And, and that that reconciliation means that neither Jew nor Gentile have any advantage in in the kingdom of God and in this grace that has been given, and that the two have now become one people. Then he he goes now to the individual in in chapter 4, where he invites us to live our vocation. I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live your vocation as a a Christian, and and to, to live your life worthy of your vocation. That, that there's an individual responsibility that is called forth because we have been elected, because of this reconciliation, because of what God has done. And then we go into chapter 5 where he talks about the family. And, and, and now if, if, if we are reconciled, then there must be a new relationship that we must have in Christ. And this new relationship is to be seen in the relationship between husband and wife. Not a relationship of domination, one over the other, but a relationship where they, each one of them is called to submit themselves to the other. And then that submission is, is shown as a relationship between Christ and his church. When, when we look at the long run of the, of the Ephesians text, and then it goes into parents and children. The, the parents are to treat their children with love, and children are to obey their parents. So it's all about reconciliation, eh? all about what God has done to bring us together. That which was fragmented has been brought together in Christ. Now Paul comes at the end of it, and he goes back to the cosmological again. And and this time, what he goes to is is a, a way of seeing the world that we in the modern world have lost sight of. Because, you know, we have kind of adopted the position that we are on a a very even playing field and that what we do is what we do and, uh, you know, it's just about free will and my choices. And Paul is saying, no, there's something more than that at play in the world. There are forces in high and low places. So he he says, he talks about the, the great forces that there are. He said, put your armor on so as to be able to resist the devil's tactics. For it is not against human enemies that you have to struggle, 
but against sovereignties and powers who originate the darkness of this world, the spiritual army of evil in the heavens. That is why you must rely on God's armor. Now, I, I suppose there, there, there are many different ways to try and understand this, and, and it's, it's, it's not an easy one. But here's what I do know. The devil is always in the extreme. Okay, I wanted, I wanted to at least hold that one. Evil always lurks in the extreme. Always. Why? Well, there are many people who believe there is no devil. And all into all kind of mythological mumbo jumbo and foolishness when you're talking about the devil. Is we doing what we're doing? Well, just take a look at the world and, and see how badly we mess it up and ask if, if we didn't, there must be some help towards going in the wrong direction, the amount of wrong direction we're going in, on the one hand. On the other hand, there are people who believe that everything is the devil. If you're old enough, you remember Flip Wilson, who said the devil made me do it. Do you remember that? Everything is the devil make me do it. In which case, I have no human responsibility for any foolishness I did. So I could blame everything on the devil and take no responsibility. You understand the extremes I'm talking about now? The, 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 the devil is always in the extremes. And, and, and when, when we see it, then we have to ask ourselves, so what are we talking about? Now, for a moment, I want you to imagine. So the way I would define the devil is the way that Ignatius of, of Loyola defines him. The enemy of human nature. So the, the, the devil is always against human nature, always. So, so whatever is deeply, truly, fundamentally human, that's what the, the, the corruption and the attack and the distortion comes to. And, and so it's always in distorting what is truly human. And if, 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 you, if you think about that, and then look back at our world again today, Look at what we've done to the planet. That's absolutely against human nature. Uh, uh, look at what we've done in, in our society. Look at the extremes that we've come to, where, where we can't even hold civil conversations anymore. So that what we have is, is the extremes that, that really kill the, the capacity of the reconciliation reconciliation and the unity for which Christ died for. Look, look at it, look at it, take a good example of what happened um, last week when the Holy Father made his statement. Just think about how you reacted now. That's all I want you to do. Just think, how did you react? Where, where was your reaction? Was it in an extreme, either well, at last, thank God, the Holy Father gets some sense. Finally, the Catholic Church gets sense. Well, that's an extreme. Or was it, well, I tell all you that man is evil, you know. I tell all you that man, that man is, the, is, the, is the Antichrist. I tell all you that. That is also a, a what? Extreme. Another extreme. I tell you, where's the devil? In the extremes. You see, both of those positions have a sense of hubris, of arrogance, and both of the positions are against what is truly human. Because to say that finally he gets sense and finally he, he, he come about and finally he, 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 is to believe that the Holy Father believes that somehow homosexuality and the homosexual act is a good thing. But he never says that, and he never agrees to that. And there's so many documented places where he says that, that the homosexual act can never be what the Christian aspires towards. It, 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 it always has to be something that is deficient, on the one hand. But on the other hand, when we condemn the Holy Father as somehow against the 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 teachings and an antichrist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are we doing? We have now put ourselves up as judge and jury of the Holy Father. 
And, and that is a form of arrogance, is it not? Yes. That is arrogance. Rather than a middle position, I don't know what Iman's saying. I do understand what he's saying. But you know what? There must be something there. Let me, let me pray. Let me wait. And, and let me discern and see if I can understand where he is going with this. That's a middle position. You see, once you understand that there is spiritual forces in high and low places, then you understand what has gone so very wrong in Western civilization with social media and with, with this incredible impulse response that we keep doing. So think about it again. You know, we have a neighbor that is having an election, correct? And, and you would swear, when I listen to Trinidadians, you would swear they have the ab ability to vote, you know. When I listen to some Trinidadians, I think they believe they could get their fingers stained over in that, in that election, eh? Because th th there's some Trinidadians who work so warm and hard and loud about, about, about this and that over there. And again, the problem is always in the... Because here's the challenge that we face. We've come to the place where in, in that election cycle and in the set of ideas that they are purporting, that people cannot even have a reasonable conversation with each other with a disagreement and have a reasoned conversation about what they can disagree about. We can't even have that conversation because the presumption is if you don't believe what I believe, you have to be an idiot. Am I wrong? Eh? If you don't believe what I believe, you're an idiot. Now, what is that? That is the extreme of arrogance. It is possible for me to not believe what you believe and have a good reason for it and not be an idiot. That's possible. But, but what we have done is we've turned the thing into a, a non-compete where there is no possibility at all for the reconciliation that Christ has won for us through, the death, through his death on a cross. There's no possibility of that whatsoever. And that's where I would say there is spiritual powers in high and low places that is devolving the Western mind into this dipolar world where, where we cannot even respect each other when we have difference of opinions. And I would say that that is what evil is. Because fundamentally, it is against the, 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 the holding together. It is against the unity. It is against fundamental human respect. It's against who we are as human beings with the capacity to disagree. And at the same time that we are disagreeing, the capacity to love one another, despite the fact that we hold very different opinions. That capacity we are losing very quickly. And that is the enemy of human nature and the enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why I'm commenting on that election from the north? Because you know, when they catch cold, we get pneumonia. Eh? Eh? They get little mild symptoms, and, and our temperature going way beep, 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 over, the, over the, the top. And, and it's important for us to understand this. So when we, when we look at, at it, you know, if I was the devil, if I was the devil, and I want you to think about that for a moment, if you were the devil, and you really wanted to get at, at this civilization, what would you do? What would you do? I, I, would, I would make it so that people can't even talk to each other. I would make it that, that if you disagree with me, then you must be an idiot and I write you off. I will make it that, that we, we take what is disordered about human humanity and, and we make it into something of a right and, and something that, that champions the right, that we have a whole pile of people champion that as a right. And then I'll, I'll make the whole set of people who are against that 
champion it so that they're so angry with them that all they're doing is anger and not love. You, you with me yet? Yeah. You, 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 you see where I'm going? That is why Paul's advice is you cannot fight this fight on your own steam. You'll get lick up. Because this is not about flesh and blood that you're fighting. This is principalities and powers in high and low places. And that if we understand that, we must also understand that, that the, the, the one criteria we must always ask ourselves, where does love carry us? Because God is always in the place of love. Where does love carry us? And love requires reconciliation and mercy. Where does love carry us is the question we have to ask. And if you ask the question about love, you ask a whole other question. So love must carry us to say to, to people who are acting out sexually outside of marriage, you know, that's not in your best interest. It's not your best self. And, and it is not living a life of virtue and a life of grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have to say that. But we must also say that you are still a human being, you still have dignity, we still love you, and we love you so much that we want the best for you. And we still have to say, as a citizen, you, you have to be protected. No mind, I disagree with you. And, and that's where love is, and where love is, is where Christ is. Paul says, stand your ground with truth buckled around your waist, integrity for breastplate, wearing the shoes on your feet, the eagerness to spread the gospel of peace, and always carrying the shield of faith so that you can use it to put out the burning arrows of the evil one. And then you must accept salvation from God to be your helmet and receive the word from God the spirit to use as a sword. All of this imagery of war that Paul is speaking about, he's not using it lightly. Because in Isaiah, Isaiah talks about the breastplate of God, the helmet of God, the shield of God. All of these images, Isaiah uses it as 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 pieces of armament that God himself possesses. So what, she, what, what Paul is saying is that in the war with evil, you cannot fight it on your own. You have to step into God and use all that God has in the fight against evil so that you don't get deceived by arrogance and believe that you could take evil on. You cannot. That's arrogance, and it will undo you, and it will undo your human nature. On the other hand, you can't say, well, I so poor me, one on foolish and stupid, that I can't do nothing. That is also the other extreme. The middle ground is this, that only through God, and by putting on the mind of Christ, and living as an emissary of God, and a disciple of Jesus Christ, and putting on his helmet, his breastplate, his shield, his shoes, by putting these on, which is integrity, righteousness, proclaiming the gospel, and, and readiness to talk truth, it is only by putting these on that, that I can be part of the army of God to defeat evil in this time. Evil is always about divisiveness, is always about arrogance, is always about speaking down to about and thinking badly about people. It's always about fragmentation. Always. God is always about love, harmony, peace. Speaking truth, but with love. Carrying and conveying righteousness and integrity, but with love. And, and, and when we understand that, we must understand now that we are in the midst of a very heady battle and that all the tools of technology and the fast pace of communication have accelerated the way in which we are devolving and our human nature is not becoming more sophisticated and, and more lived, 
but in fact it is becoming less sophisticated, less lived, and, and less to the fore of our humanity and our society. And if we could understand that, we'll understand we have to all take one step back. Take a step back and ask yourself, are you living the loving thing? And are you living with truth? And that's why Pope Benedict spoke about truth, caritas, and veritate. Charity and truth. Because in this time, Pope Benedict understood that you can't just hold charity alone, and you can't just hold truth alone. You must be willing to hold charity and truth together. And they have to be held together in this paradox because only when we hold both of them do we come to the center and have the fruitful conversation about where God is and what God is doing in our time. Amen? Amen.